So I just met Massimo, who's one of the owners of uh, part of this land, and he explained to me that where we are now has basically been abandoned for the last two years because the guy that uh, owns it hasn't been out to cut uh, for two years because he's very, very old, which is a, a big problem. Um, essentially, what we can see here is a process of ecological succession where we get uh, shrubs and then larger woody veg vegetation coming in. Uh, here we have Rubus fruticosus, uh, bramble, and then behind me there are seedlings of hornbeam, Carpinus betulus, which uh, obviously is coming from the oak hornbeam forest, uh, so, uh, which, which is surrounding this grassland. And uh, essentially this shows the importance of management, the importance of mowing. Uh, although it might sound counterintuitive that a human disturbance, an anthropogenic disturbance, can be beneficial for biodiversity, mowing is essentially preventing larger plants, which need more time to establish, it's preventing them from getting a foothold and from taking over and monopolizing the area. So essentially, in ecological succession, there is a natural development through the years as larger plants come in um, and the vegetation gets taller and taller and taller until eventually we have woodland. Um, but essentially the management is resetting that, taking it back to an appropriate point for the smaller herbaceous plants and for the grassland. So it's absolutely essential. So another thing that Massimo explained to me was how he uses his land um, for small-scale agriculture. Essentially, it's not used for one particular thing. It's not just about olive production. Um, he has planted some, um, some vines, so Chardonnay grapes for making wine, but he produces rhubarb and makes rhubarb jam. He gave me some rhubarb jam before. Um, and um, also for, for just small-scale vegetable production. Um, up on some of the terraces, he's also prepared some land, uh, which we'll see later, uh, for maize production. So to produce uh, maize flour, so to, to make something that we call polenta. And um, so essentially there's a patchiness also in how it's used agriculturally. It's not devoted to any one particular crop or any one particular system. We have grapevines, we have uh, rhubarb production, all sorts of different ways of cultivating plants. So it's generally a very heterogeneous environment, um, a very patchy environment, both with regard to the semi-natural vegetation, but also with regard to the cultivation and the crops. And of course, we're interested in the um, diversity of the species that are living together within the grassland. But a part of that is also the fact that there are groups of plants, groups of uh, different species around within these patches which can contribute with seeds. Uh, they contribute to what we call the species pool, the total um, amount of the total number of species that can be found in an environment uh, which basically depends on seed dispersal. So the fact that there are small patches of native vegetation throughout the crops is actually very important even to the areas of extensive grassland because they're a source of seeds, they're a source of different species, which then we do find in the grassland as well. So it's about patchiness uh, within the general local landscape. One of the reasons why terraced cultivation like this is particularly encouraging for biodiversity, um, it's not just about resetting the ecological succession, but you can see that the slopes are havens, safe havens for uh, native species. And um, this is a kind of spatial patchiness, a kind of heterogeneity, where those species can find a place to live. So it's cultivated, there's disturbance, there are patches of ground that are very, very heavily disturbed, 
but there are spaces where the native species can live. So just as another example of spatial patchiness, spatial heterogeneity, uh, Massimo was explaining to me that this plot of land, this particular plot of land this year, will be used for maize production. You can see the main grassland back there in the background, but uh, over to my right, there is also a nice example of the grass under the olive trees, which hasn't been cut. So the vegetation is slightly taller. And again, we have some heterogeneity in this environment with the, the same general mix of species that I can see in the main grassland over there. Um, but the, the, the plants are at a slightly different developmental stage. So Massimo was telling me a little bit about the history of this place, which is very pertinent to how it's managed today. And um, essentially that white house you can see, the idea was originally that all of the landowners would put their money together and buy it, and it would be a commune for recovering drug addicts. And the idea was, of course, to give drug addicts a, an occupation, something to do, something to involve them, and um, this would uh, essentially help with the maintenance of the environment and the habitats that we see here. And I think for me it illustrates a very important point, that there has to be a reason for uh, doing work on the land, and, and that's the way that we uh, get to this point of having a high biodiversity grassland because it's not just the natural processes that are happening here It's not just the evolution. It's not just the immediate ecology. It's about the economic activity So if there's one word that I think uh, Encapsulates the biggest influence that humans have on biodiversity. I think it's economy the economy uh, the economy can be a positive thing uh, economic activities can bring about a situation of high biodiversity like we see here. Well, the economy can take a different turn and it can be essentially a negative force. It depends on what that economic activity is.